Okay, uh, let's get started then. Uh, I think we're missing only one people from the students, but uh, I guess that's okay. And uh, this is just the first day, first class, so we won't go into anything difficult, any tricky uh, material. So I, uh, I will start sharing my screen. Okay. Can everybody see the screen? The slides? Yes. All good? Okay. All right, let's get started. Okay, so welcome to uh, Special Topics Machine Learning for Healthcare. Uh, this is course number AI810. And this is the officially first class. Uh, okay, so let's get started. So the agenda for today is that we're just going to introduce the material, the overall, overall uh, theme of this class and what you can expect to learn and the structure of the course. So basically, first of all, I mean, this is the, the title of the class is machine learning for healthcare. So we'll, we're going to talk about what is healthcare and why you should care about it. And then, then we'll go into like the gradings and the attendance, the material and all, all the technical details. All right. So healthcare and artificial intelligence. So goal, I mean, for me personally, I think it, this is just generally true, but for me specifically, the goal of healthcare and AI is to use AI technology to improve healthcare for all. And there are three terms that are pretty ambiguous, pretty, pretty vague and very like abstract in this sentence. So first is, a, I mean, the, the three words are AI technology, healthcare, and all. Like what is AI and what is healthcare and what is all? So these are all like, we need, we need to define them to be really specific about what we want to care about. So AI, I mean, this is Korea. We have all gone through the AlphaGo, the, the fiasco. We, we know what it is. We generally have a good idea what AI is. So I won't go into detail. But then this is, I mean, we're talking to neighbor engineers and uh, Kai students. So we, we are familiar with what this is. I usually use this material for when I present uh, in front of like doctors or, or medical experts as well. So this is kind of like a general topic for everybody. So AI, I'm going to skip that. What is healthcare? So healthcare, for, for machine learning researchers or engineers, what we immediately think about when we hear the word healthcare for AI, like machine learning for healthcare or AI for healthcare, we are, we, we usually think about something like this. Like we have a, like an image, uh, it could be MRI image. It could be like a retina image, like such as seen here, or it could be uh, CT scans, x-rays, whatever, like some, some kind of image and then we want to do something with it. Like we want to classify whether the patient is suffering from like cancer or has breast cancer or some, something, some, some like noticeable disease. So this here, this picture is a very uh, well-received and very popular paper from Google. Uh, no, this is not from Google. This is from Stanford, I think. Uh, or maybe both, I'm not sure. Uh, this is like, yeah, this is, I think this is Stanford. So detecting di diabetic retinopathy with deep learning. So this is from JAMA 2016. And JAMA is like the most, like most prestigious medical journal. One of the med most prestigious medical journals, like on the par with like New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet and JAMA. They're, they're like very, very prestigious, like top notch uh, journals. And this was like on the headline. So they, like medical journals usually don't really care about machine learning technologies. They don't really care about like AI and stuff, but this was so revolutionary, so innovative that they decided to like put this in, into the journal. So basically what they did is what the engineers or researchers did is they just took the inception model from Google and then they just trained it with a lot of retina, uh, retina images and then try to classify whether the image contains diabetic retinopathy or not. So it's a binary classifier and they just did, Generally, they scored better score than like uh, eye doctors, so to speak. So this was kind of like the kind of, kind of like a big hit in 2016. So this is what we usually think about. But healthcare is such a broad term. It's not just medical imaging or uh, or making automatic diagnosis or smart watches. It's most it, it's so much. It's like a broad, very broad term, like an umbrella term, because everything could be healthcare. Like human lives are healthcare. So. Hospital administration, this is a big part of healthcare because hosp hospitals are basically like a company. They need to make profit while taking care of patients. So they need to like have operate, they have operational issues. So this like big part of healthcare is about hospital, how to administrate 
hospital day-to-day uh, -day, day -day chores. So readmission prediction, automatic triage, automatic coding, these are all like something that could be automated with AI technology. And so like the human experts, doctors, nurses can do less of these menial tasks. Uh, daily monitoring is coming, it's kind of becoming a big thing these days. Wearable devices like Fitbit, Fitbit was acquired by Google. So we can expect Google will be doing something with Fitbit data, just like Apple is doing something with Apple Watch data. Home cameras, AI speakers, they're all in your homes. Like people voluntarily buy AI speakers and speak to them and giving like big companies the voice data. It's like a good, it's, it's a good era to be like IT company these days. Uh, drug development is also like an up and coming application of healthcare. I mean, up and coming application of uh, machine learning technologies. They try to discover new compounds or try to uh, uh, predict whether there will be adverse events when you take one drug with another, like they will have like a combination, uh, combination of like effects in your, in your, in your, in your system. And it could be, it could like fire a adverse event. So that's kind of like a, uh, new topic these days and disease specific cares. This is kind of a classical era, a classical area. Like they, people can develop new machine learning models for diabetes only or Alzheimer's only or asthma or COPD. Like they want to predict the trajectory or the st stages that the patients go through when they have Alzheimer's, for example. Like there are various uh, types or d stages. So if you are, if you care about, if you're like a doctor of a specific area, then you might care about specific diseases. So healthcare is a broad term and all like uh, this, oh, there should be like red here and black here. So when we talk about healthcare for, so healthcare is that, healthcare is a very broad term. All is also a broad term because as, as a consumer or a client, we, when we go to the hospital, we, are, we usually go to the hospital as a patient. So we don't know much about medical expert. We don't know much about medical knowledge. None of us are medical expertise. So we usually think about healthcare. We think about receiving healthcare as a patient, but there are a lot of players in healthcare actually. So there's not just patients, but there are doctors, uh, hospitals. And some people might think that doctors and hospitals are the same thing, but they are actually a different entity. Doctors are employees and hospitals are a company. So they have different like areas of interest. Doctors usually generally want to treat patients. If they're good doctors, they only care about patient healthcare, but hospitals, they need to operate. They need to maintain their revenue. So it's kind of a different, they have different perspective. And insurance is also a big player. Government is a big player, especially in Korea. There, we have a centralized insurance system as opposed to American where it's like a, there are a lot of third party insurance companies. So government is a big, uh, big party, a big player in the, in the healthcare uh, space. And pharmaceutical companies are also a big, big player. They make, they spend tons of money. They make tons of money. So if you care about making money, you should really work with some pharmaceutical companies. So it's uh, AI for healthcare is a very like umbrella term, very broad term, and it covers many industries, as I've just said, and it has a lot of opportunities, but we don't know all of them because we are, as a, like a machine learning researcher, we only care about specific methodologies or specific applications. And we don't know all the nooks and crannies of healthcare industry, and we don't know all the opportunities. So the important thing is to actually talk to the doctors, talk to the healthcare experts, talk to the administrators, the government officers to, see where the innovation, the opportunity for innovation lies. So, and of course, a lot of people know this on the surface. So a lot of companies and schools are investing in healthcare and AI these days. So companies like Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, they all have their own division or team for healthcare, either secret or, or explicit. Uh, Amazon is using like uh, Amazon using uh, Amazon Prime for delivering drugs. Google has actually Google Health as a like a, uh, one of the Prime departments. MSR uh, Microsoft has a team called uh, Health. I forgot the name of the team. They have a like a new new like initiative in Seattle and in Cambridge and England. Uh, Apple has also a lot of healthcare applications starting from Watch, but they also have their own like data sense. So they are also heavily investing. So it's a good time to be in healthcare space. So, so the, I've already laid out that the healthcare is a broad term, but the focus of this specific course, AI 810, would be how to use electronic health records to build intelligent machines or 
like predictive machines or interpretable predictive machines, clustering machines, all, all those like different techniques that you can do with EHR. So let's get into what EHR is. So EHR is everything that happens to a patient. In, in, so when I say this, the focus of this course is EHR is that I, we're not going to deal with like Fitbit data. We don't have Fitbit data. Like Fitbit is not going to give students their data. So that's out of the question. We don't have genetics data. I mean, I guess we could get our hands on a small portion of genetics data, but generally speaking, genetics, uh, genetic information is a very like high privacy risk data. So they don't really share the, those data. Uh, so there are a lot of healthcare related data. As I said, healthcare, there are a lot of like, a lot of scopes, a lot of industry uh, segments. So we can't do all of them. So we are going to talk about electronic health records for the most part in this course, because it's a, it's easy to, access because there are a couple of open source EHR data set out there and B is pretty close to NLP like text that text data so it's more familiar to deal with so and it's it's easier to do projects on EHR than I don't know Fitbit data because you, you can't you can't access your Fitbit data if you want if you're interested in doing projects on like wearables you're gonna have to get your own data which I can't provide so we'll we're generally mostly gonna stick to EHR so what is EHR? So EHR is a, it's not a very new, new term. It's been around for like 10, 15 years, maybe 20 years. Um, so it's everything that happens to a patient. So when you go to a hospital as a patient, then doctors and nurses, they take a lot of information from you and then you, you have to fill out all the forms and then they get transported to electronic database. So that is what electronic health record is. Everything about you that you go through in hospitals. So this is just a picture that I took from Wikipedia. So this is just an example of what doctors see when they see you, the patient. So patient comes to a doctor's office and they sit across from the doctor's desk and uh, doctors will pull up your data. So they will type, your, type in your name, like Edward Choi, and then they will pull up your data. And then this is kind of like, this is the example screen of what doctors might see about you. So there's like first name, last name, birthday, uh, it's a picture of a baby, but it could be your picture. Um, uh, yeah, so, so meetings, like previous meetings, like how many times you've been to the hospital or specifically to this doctor, what kind of symptoms you had before, like uh, there's diagnosis. And what, I guess some, some electronic health records program provides this kind of like visual, uh, visual aid, like where if the patient says, says that like my stomach hurts, then the doctor might, might be able to like point to the, a specific area. Uh, there are uh, different, like a lot of notes, digestive notes, like admission notes, discharge notes. So this is like a comprehensive set of about about patient, and then they all get dumped into. Uh, okay, they all get dumped into a relational database. I'll talk about that in the next slide. So the thing about EHR, the electronic health records, is it is it is explodingly. Uh, it's I mean, a lot of doctors are adopting electronic health records in one form or, not, or another. So there are two graphs here. So two lines, one line is any EMR system, black is basic EMR system. And by the year 2015, so this is US, this is United States uh, statistics. So ever since from 2000 or something, uh, maybe it was Bush or maybe it was Obama. I'm, I'm not sure which administration, but they like declared a new, uh, new regulation or, or new law that they encourage doctors to adopt electronic health records to, to dump to store everything into electronic form. So it's increasingly being adopted. And by year 2015, any EMR system means like you, 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 uh, you store patient re information in any form. It doesn't have to be like completely like, like qualified EMR, but any like billing information, diagnosis information, if you transform it into electronic form, it qualifies as any EMR system. So uh, about by the year 2015, 86, 87% of office-based physicians were using some form of electronic health record solution. And now as we're living in the year 2020, so I'm pretty sure it's about 95-ish or and some, some, somewhere between 90, 95%. So you can assume that if you go to hospital, you're, any hospital, any, any office space physicians, your, your data will be electronically, will be dumped into their system. And then a lot of, a lot of US, US physicians, they are a member of a healthcare network like Kaiser Permanente or Geisinger or Sutter, like if you're 
familiar with those company names, they are like healthcare networks. So they are a network of hospitals and doctors. So when you go to a hospital and the doctor is a member of, for example, Kaiser, then when the doctor puts your information into their system, it'll be like merged into the Kaiser database. So Kaiser can have like millions and millions and millions of data, uh, patient records. So yeah, that's how it, how things operate in the United States. In Korea, it's a bit different because Korea is using centralized insurance. So uh, if you go to a hospital, then doctors have their own system. So it doesn't get like fed to like healthcare network. So if, but it's a different story when you go to like a big, big like university hospitals like Asan, University, uh, Asan Medical Center or Samsung Medical Center or Bundang Seoul National University Center. They're like big, big giant hospitals. So like millions of patients go to those hospitals. So they have like electronic health records of at least like 5 million to 10 million patients and like spanning over like five to 10 years. So we would like to work with them if possible as a healthcare, healthcare researcher. So this, yeah, so that was the status of EHR. And what EHR is basically, it's a, it's a relational database. So I'm not sure about Korean system, but in the United States, there are like two or three prominent EHR, electronic health record solution companies like Epic or Cerner. They are a database company. They are a solution company. So they provide their EHR solution to big hospitals and usually it's mostly just uh, relational database. So they're like patient table. So the, as a, just, just a recap, relational database, they have like a lot of tables and each table serves its own purpose. And then there are like foreign keys and primary keys that can link between different tables. So there are patient tables, for example, where you see a lot of records about patient, like their names, their birth dates, their gender, whatever. And then there's encounter tables. So encounter means when you go to a hospital, it's an encounter. So everything about encounter, like when that happened, like for the reason that happened, something like that, the, the responsible doctor for that encounter. And then there are medica medication order table. When, when a doctor orders an aspirin or Tylenol, it goes into the medication order table. Procedure order table, it's another table. Like if you order an IV fluid, or if you take an x-ray or EKG, they all go, to, go through a procedure order table. So a lot of tables and they intermingle with primary keys and foreign keys. And if you like pull them together, then it becomes kind of like a hierarchical graph structure. So I, yeah, we'll, we'll get to how to deal with graphical structure in like later, later courses, later classes. So this is what it looks like on the, on the, on the, on the surface, like there's patient, and then you can, each, each patient has a series of encounters and then each encounter has its own information such as like diagnosis code, like the reason for encounter, like fatigue, cough, fever. And then for some diagnosis, there are medications order like acid, acid amine, amine theme being like Tylenol and benzodiazepine. Like there are a lot of inf information. So pre-processing EHR is a big part of uh, healthcare research actually. So EHR consists of structured codes. So visit after visit, one after another, like it's a sequence of visit and each visit has cough fever, like diagnosis codes, medication codes and procedure codes. And you can think of those codes as words in NLP because they're just discrete concept. It doesn't mean anything to the, to, the, to the computer. Like dog and cat doesn't mean anything to the computer. Just like cough and fever doesn't mean anything to the computer. It's a discrete concept. And then there are of course, lab measures. When you go to hospital, you take blood pressure. Uh, it's a lab measure. You take temperature. It's a lab measure. You take like a allergy, allergenic responses. It's also a lab measure. And then spectrograms are like a time series data. So when you take EKG or EEG, you see like these kind of like uh, spectrograms. And image is also part of EHR. When you go to hospital, you take CT scans, MRI scans, x-rays. They all like get dumped into their database. So it's like, there are a lot, it's a multimodal data set EHR. That's what it makes, what makes it so interesting and challenging. Images, free text is also there. So when you go to hospital, doc doctors will ask you a lot of questions and then they write the responses into the, into the computer. So that becomes free text form report. And that's also a big part of EHR. So, and not just this, there are like demographic information, demographic being like gender, whether you are married or what your ethnicity is. For example, in the United States, there are like, you know, like Indians, uh, black people, Asian people, white people. So ethnicity is also a big part of demographic information. Billing information is also important because not everybody has insurance. Unlike in Korea, in the United States, not a lot of people, not everybody has 
insurance and people have different kinds of insurance. So billing information is important. Uh, some, some advanced hospitals have genetic information as well. So they take like genetic samples from, like they take swabs from their, the, the mouth of the patient that they sequence the genes and they dump that into the database, but it's, it doesn't happen to everybody. Uh, gene information is especially useful for like cancer patients because different cancer types have different like gene activations. So some some if you have very specific gene activation, then some anti-cancer drugs might work really well for you. But on the other end, like some people without the gene activation, they might have to take a different route. So genetic information is heavily used in pharma like cancer pharmaceutical companies and cancer treatment regimes. All right. So any questions so far? I mean, I'd like to make this uh, course very interactive, but this is online course. So I'm not sure if it'll be very feasible, but if you have any question during my, during like all the blah blahs of my, uh, coming from me, please uh, interject. Uh, or actually we can use ch chat room. I'm not sure if I, how, how do I see the chat room here? Okay, so I have a question. So, how about sure. the yeah, how about the status of the standardization? I mean, the actually many hospital use mm -hmm. the uh, diverse equipment or the um, diverse machines for the mm -hmm. uh, recording or the measuring their their patient, right? So, mm -hmm. is there any the strict standard or the platform? to recording EHR systems? Oh, yeah, think... that's a very, very interesting question. It's a very practical question as well, because like, as, as Dr. Ha said, uh, hospitals used to, I mean, even, so as I said, there are, let's talk about United States scenario. So United States, there are three, two or three major EHR providers, which was, which was Epic and Cerner. But even if, as a hospital, if, even if you use Epic solution, it, the, the format of the data is always different. Like Epic provides solutions to different hospitals for suiting different needs. So formats and names of the variables and the table, table schemas, they're all different hospital by hospital. So there was a, like a rising need for unifying or merging the format into a like unified form to, to facilitate, you know, patient care or even research. So uh, data standardization, might we might talk about that in the maybe next class or maybe one at one after that but basically there are two major movements in data standardization at least in united states i'm not sure about korea uh, south korea situation but in the united states there are two major movements one is op one is fire which is f h i r adopted by google and the other is omop which is o m o p i think it was designed by odyssey o h d s i so like a like a consortium of healthcare researchers. So FHIRE is F-H-I-R. So FHIRE means a fast, uh, I forgot, it's, a, like a, it's to facilitate transport, a tra transfer of data of one hospital to another. Because as I said, hospitals have different formats. So if they wanna, trans if they wanna like exchange data about patients, they need to have a sync, like a unified format. So FHIRE was, designed to suit, to, to accommodate that need. So you, it's, it's like a, FHIR is like another version, it's like a meta version of, of a relational database. It's a, a database schema and it's just that they, the, the, the people that designed FHIR went to a lot of hospitals and talked to a lot of doctors and a lot of administrators and they came up with a, like a meta, a template that can suit everybody's needs. So as like intuitively, Fire has like patient table. Well, they, they don't call it table, they call it resource, but there's like patient resource, there's encounter resource, medication resource. It's just like, a, it's, it try to, tries to accommodate the existing database schema for a lot of hospitals so that they can like easily map one from another. And then they, so they encode the data, that they encode the hospital specific format into fire format and then send it to another, another hospital. And then the other hospital, the one that receives the fire format, need to decode it into their own format. So it's like a protocol. So that is one adopted by Google because Google wants to operate, wants to uh, work with a lot of partners at the same time. So that's what Google does. And OMAP is a bit different. So OMAP is less business oriented. Fire is very business oriented, but OMAP is more research friendly. So it means that it is less uh, refined for now. So, and I haven't really dug into OMAP yet, but it's, 
I, as far as I know, uh, Bundang Seoul National University is adopting OMAP. I think Asan, Univers Asan Medical Center is also adopting OMAP. So I guess that's what Korean hospitals do these days. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's the, that's the situation. And uh, um, as a single, as a, like an individual researcher, we don't need to really care about like a data standardization. But uh, if, for example, if like a large IT company such as Naver is interested in partnering with like various uh, medical centers, then data standardization may be like a big issue. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that briefly may, when we talk about EHR in depth. All right, so. Oh, can I ask the question? Sure, so, sure. Oh, so, you know, many of people do not go to hospital very regularly, at least me. But, mm -hmm. So I think there's a very large gap between data and data. So do we cover how, to, do we, will we cover how to inter interpolate between the data and data? So uh, some people call that missing data problem, uh, but there are, I, I, so yeah, that's a very, I mean, that's a very practical question as well. So the problem with dealing with EHR, the electronic health records is that the data is available only when patients visit the hospital. So people like some, I'm not sure who asked the question, but like for, for such people, a person as, as such as yourself who doesn't go to hospital very often, then it, you, you don't generate a lot of EHR. So we can't do a lot about you, like whether you'll, develop like diabetes or hypertension or something like that, like some, some chronic disease, we want to be able to predict that. But if you don't go to hospital and don't generate data, then we can't do it. So it's a fundamentally, it's, I think it's, there is no solution for that unless we incorporate more data. For example, uh, this could be like privacy infringement, but if we start to incorporate like cacao talk Chat, chat messages, chat logs, then we can very, very accurately predict what you're going to have because people talk all kinds of, all kinds of stuff on Kakao Top. Or if we can dump Gmail uh, email threads, then we can probably very, very accurately predict what you're going to have, what you're going to suffer because people, you know, they, they, have, they do a lot of stuff on Gmail. Or if we can, if we can access, your, access the dump of neighbor map search like logs, then we exactly know what you're gonna do because you visit certain places. Like if you visit like barbecue places very often, then we know that you're gonna get hypertension. But if you go to like, I don't know, like uh, fitness centers very often, then we don't really have much concern for you. So I think unless we have more data to fill in the gaps between the encounters, like, like this is a line of timeline and then you only go to hospital like very sparsely, and then unless there's a way to fill in the gaps, there's no real good way to deal with that. And do, like estimating missing data or trying to impute what happened in between here is just, I don't think it's very, I don't think it's re, uh, very uh, realistic because a lot of things can happen between here. Like, I mean, your life is here and there is no way to estimate your life. So I don't think, I mean, I think, the reason that Google acquired Fitbit is because they know the problem of like big chunk of your life missing. And if we can at least access your fit, Fitbit data, like your uh, heart rate or how many, how many like steps you walked per day, like then this pretty bad, it's like much better than nothing. So I think the overall healthcare industry will move towards that uh, starting with like companies that own wearable devices like Apple Watch, Galaxy Gear. Uh, I think it's Galaxy Watch these days. Uh, Fitbit as well. And if companies are more daring, they will try to incorporate AI speaker uh, recordings uh, because they, the AI pe people like ask questions about various questions on AI speaker. They have, so it's a query log. And then when you have query log, you can do a lot of stuff on them. But people don't like when companies listen to what you're saying to the AI speaker. So I think, yeah, there's, so it's, it's a ba very, basically it's a trade-off. This uh, it's a paradox because the more data people are willing to give to either government or IT companies, they can do better service for you, but people don't like to do that. So I'm, I'm not sure where, where it'll all head towards. I think there needs to be like a social, like a consensus or something to make like great things happen with IT, so IT services. All right, so let's move on then. 
All right, so the next one is just a very, very simple introduction to deep learning. So I guess everybody here is very familiar with deep learning, but just a like five minute recap. So deep learning is just the, so there's a very like super set of everything which is called artificial intelligence. And AI was like started in 1950s when Alan Turing, so Alan Turing who, who invented the computer, he also was curious about computers that can play chess. So that was like back in the 50s. So chess playing, AI was was at least was was thought of or like rev devised in the back in the 50s and then like for like 50 years or maybe for 40 years AI was no it was going nowhere like uh, uh, expert system uh, fuzzy system they weren't going anywhere and then in the mid fifth mid mid 90s maybe like starting from SVM and VCD uh, all the like statistical learning from the very famous Vapnik I think that also spark the uh, the modern machine learning uh practice so they in the early nine maybe in the mid 90s like late 90s people are using very simple stuff trying to teach the machine to the very specific task with a very like highly labeled data like heavily labeled data doing spam filtering for example and then deep learning is like another subset of machine learning so deep learning is uh maybe it starts from 2012 2014 maybe and it's the difference between machine learning and deep learning is that deep learning uses more data and we don't need feature engineering. And we'll talk about that in the next, next, next slide. So, so deep learning is just, so artificial intelligence superset, machine learning is a subset of AI, and deep learning is a subset of machine learning. And the reason that AI, deep learning is so like popular is because it simply works better. It's all practicality, it's engineering. So back before deep learning, like AlexNet, people were not very, not doing very great job with ImageNet challenges. And that ever since the birth of AI, I mean, birth of deep learning, like it's just pushing, pushing the boundary like to the superhuman level. So people have generally like 5% error rate when they try to ca classify images of a dog or a cat or airplanes or cars. So it's, it means 95% accuracy, but start, uh, Google Net and ResNet, they do better than humans. So it's basically, I think the uh, image classification task is pretty much solved and they are, people are focusing on more like challenging, more in, in, uh, important or more complex, interesting problems. So deep learning, it just works well. And another thing is that it just, it's so easy to start to, to, to for people with uh, not so, gr people with like limited knowledge of like statistical machine learning and all the like st stats and probs and optimization, they, it, like deep learning doesn't require you to do that. It, it's a very nice way of like a democratization, democratization of machine learning. So less feature engineering means before before deep learning, we needed to think about we needed domain knowledge basically. It's like in order to classify whether a, this picture is a dog, we needed to think about the characteristics of a dog and then teach that to a machine. Like dog has ears and dog has eyes and dog has furs and tongues. So we need to like teach the machine to focus on those characteristics in order to classify or predict whether this is a dog. So if you're talking about images, then you need, like there will be dog experts and there will be cat experts. There will be tech, NLP experts. There will be healthcare experts. Like they, we need a lot of experts from various domains to think about these characteristics. It took a long time, but in deep learning, you just dump a lot of image and then the machine will figure out the we'll do a feature extraction classification at the same time simultaneously for you. So it's a very like easy process compared to before. So, and how was this possible? Like how, why didn't, why, why didn't deep learning happen be before 2012? Why, why now? Why like in the uh, 2012 and 2014? So basically we need large data to make, make the deep learning work. So large data, thanks to social network, people just voluntarily upload their data without even taking money from companies. Like they, they give data to large IT companies. So, which is like a very weird, weird behavior. And news article, Wikipedia, ImageNet, there are a lot of big data to learn, to train your machine learning, like deep learning system. So it's a, like we, we live in a very data rich era. And another thing is that before, like the theory was there and maybe data was there, but the compute power wasn't there. And these days, GPUs and TPUs, they do all those heavy lifting for you. So TPU is uh, like a kind of a GPU developed by uh, Google. And then uh, like very recent models such as BERT or T5, they are trained on TPUs for like weeks or days. So 
uh, like not a lot of people can do that, but at least some companies can do this. So this like compute power plus large data was what gave birth to the modern deep learning. And in the same spirit, the compute power is already there. We, we have at, at least GPU, we don't have TPUs, but we at least have GPUs. And there are a lot of data on the health side, because as I said, as I showed before, a lot of company, a lot of hospitals are adopting electronic health records. So there, the data is accumulating like by the day. So there are like millions and millions of patient records. So if you combine the two, the compute power and the sheer volume of health data, then we can probably do a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, these are just like an example I took from uh, some, some pro, pre, uh, prominent healthcare researchers. But basically what they're saying is with the combination of, of this and this, we can save costs and save lives. And this, this, this is as important as this because in order to save lives, we need to be efficient. If you spend millions of dollars for saving one patient, nobody's gonna do that. Because it's a very like realistic problem. All right, so that's that. So that's the uh, context of the whole, why care about healthcare and AI. Um, any question? All right, then we'll move on to the, oh, Lee Sang. Oh, this is nice. This is a nice feature. Raised hand. All right. So please go ahead. Oh, Professor, could you, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. And I just want to hear ask you because you're kind of prominent research in this field. But <laughs> I you. once heard that some critics says that to detect and, as you said, to make it feasible of all of these processes, Mm -hmm. uh, we have to focus more on the science of healthcare, which is kind of more basic science stuff. Mm -hmm. The kind of these works are kind of more than data processing and data engineering. So this is kind mm -hmm. of relatively stagnated field than the basic science itself. So mm -hmm. I want to just ask your opinion about this. Actually, that's a that's a very well known fact that. Uh, in order to save lives, machine learning, you, you, you're better off educating people to wash their hands than provide their data. Like washing hands is way more important than developing like machine learning models. So there's like different aspects, but I mean, as a, as a, I mean, we're, but we're, we're not in the field of epidemiologists or like public health care or like medical expertise. We, are, we don't go around to people to well, I mean, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in machine learning, how and what machine learning or AI can do in the healthcare field with all this data. So that's what we're after. But, uh, that, but the, the, the opinion about doing basic science is very much justified because that could basically save more lives than doing machine learning, as I said. Like, cough, like covering, your, covering your mouth when you're coughing, doing hand sanitizer, this is way more important than just, you know, AI. So, but that's, that's a different story. It's like a completely different area with completely different interests. Here we are talking about machine learning and what we can do with healthcare data. So that's, let's focus on this first and then talk about the science maybe in another day. And uh, for what we can do with healthcare data and AI is there, we need to be very careful about what we want to do. We don't want to like go around and run, run around and claim that we can predict cancer when the cancer will start or when the, if the cancer can be cured, we, we don't want to do like a, we don't want to make bold claims before we have like a, like a rigorous proof. But what we can do is we can help the doctors make informed decisions, or we can automate a lot of menial chores that medical experts go through in the hospital, or we can make doctors make less mistakes, less mistakes by like, you know, by looking at the data and then trying to predict what the doctor should do and what the doctor shouldn't do and then maybe make like an alarm system. So that's kind of the things that the hospitals are usually interested in these days. So when hospital administrators come to me or to like machine learning researchers, they don't ask the machine learning experts to predict cancer or cure cancer. They usually want to like have a pipeline of things that happen in the, like a, like a pipeline of thing like a, task that goes through the system in the hospital every day and then try to monitor the monitor the behaviors or monitor the like the activities of healthcare experts and then try to like rectify correct correct uh, rectify the wrong behaviors or make an alarm when the wrong behavior is monitored 
or maybe do like a pre preemptive risk assessment when the patient comes in, like do a, like a low risk risk assessment. Like if you live like this, you might get hospital, like heart, hypertension or heart failure within like six months. That's like way harmless than claiming that you're going to have cancer. So there's like a lot of uh, spectrum that we can do with machine learning using healthcare data. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. All right. Professor, I have a question. Sure. Uh, until which extent can machine learning have an active role on data sharing? For now, oh. Until now, I see. Like, until now, I see that we have a passive role. We only uh -huh. get the data and work with that. But until which extent we can push, uh, like for example, to a string case, the government uh -huh. to incentive the data sharing culture, like. For example, to say, uh, I, if we have at least, at least your GPS record, mm -hmm. we can work better with models. Until we just mm -hmm. then, we can have an active role in that part. Um, I actually thought about the kind, so I thought about making a startup company trying to convince people to share more data. Uh, for example, we can, as you said, we can incentivize people to get actually monetary reward. Like if you share your data, to this platform and then we make money out of your data, we can share the dividend with you. Like some, something like that, we can think about a lot of different ways to incentivize people to share their data. But I think in, I don't know, this could be like the, the nature of healthcare or, or the life itself, but people are more willing to share their data if it is used for common good rather than making money. So for, uh, there was a, like a, a poll the, conducted on the cancer patients. So people, I think it was done by, I don't know, maybe Asan or maybe Bundang Hasal National University, but a doctor, so people, so the hospital asked the cancer patients will, if they were willing to share their, all their records, like genetics and everything, just like bottom up every 100% to other cancer patients who might benefit from their data. And they were all like, like 95% yes, because they knew the, the pain and the suffering that people go through when they, when, when they have cancer. But when they twist that question to, are you willing to share your data so that some company can make profit by helping other people? And they were like, like 30%, like 70% like no, like they were not willing to share their data. So when, when the profit or the like financial reward is involved, people are very like wary about sharing their data. I don't know why. I, even if they're even if they're like being rewarded, I think they they just don't like the idea of like making somebody else making money out of their data. But if they're if the the, the objective or the aim is to serve the community or to make the national healthcare improve, I think then that could be like better better sales pitch. But mm -hmm. it it is not something that like an individual person can do. It's something that like a consortium of hospitals and researchers should you know really make progress um yeah i yeah that's just my my impression i don't have any like specific agenda to 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 do that okay thank you yep no problem all right then let's move on so yeah scope of the course uh so there are four big topics which is math programming domain knowledge and communication and Math is pretty evident because we're talking about machine learning. So some math will be involved. I'm not sure. So depending on the quiz result from today, I will try to adjust the level of like basic, how, how much like basic material I want to cover. Programming, this is kind of a must because we're going to do projects. And uh, at least I hope that a lot of people are familiar with at least scikit-learn or TensorFlow or PyTorch. And some people might be interested in doing like big data analysis using MapReduce, MapReduce uh, philosophy. That's all, that's on them. I won't, if there is request, I will talk about MapReduce, but if not, I will not touch that. Uh, domain knowledge. So this is, this is healthcare. Uh, this is machine learning for healthcare. So the application will be healthcare specific. It could be about data standard as Dr. Ha said, it could be about predicted modeling or interpretability because healthcare, we need to convince doctors to believe the outcome of the predictive model. So how to, inter how to make the model interpretable or explainable, that's also like a big issue. Graph, as I said, the, uh, when you dump the EHR, it can, it can be seen as a graph. So graph is a big issue in the domain, uh, in, the, in the healthcare domain. 
And we'll, yeah, we'll talk a lot about the domains. And communication is because we're going to, I hope that we can do project presentation at the, like, instead of like doing final exam, I hope that we can do like a project presentation. So like vi visual aid, uh, writings and like reports and, you know, basic the, the slides and everything. So let's, so these will be the four col columns, four, four pillars of this course. And the structure is that uh, since this is online, I'm not sure if, if just me talking all the time will be very efficient. So hope that I can, this will be like, this will, this is technical detail, but some kind of somewhere between like 50, 50, 50, 50 lecture and project will be like ideal. Even if it was not, if it, even if it were not online, I would still like to do that. Like I want to make the course more interactive and more uh, hands-on rather than just doing I mean, this is, a, this is more application oriented. So I don't want to talk more, I don't want to just focus on theoretical stuff and just, you know, walk away unless you really implement and learn and run your model and then debug, you won't like all the theoretical material won't stick into your brain actually. And then the gradings will be, uh, I'm thinking project 50% and then assignment 45% attendance 5% and assignments will be pretty light load. I don't want to put too much load on like, well, you know, like very heavy programming assignments. I, I'm not, I don't, yeah. I don't have enough TAs and this is just, this is my first semester. So I don't have a lot of like resources to do like big, big scale stuff. So it'll be light assess, light assignments, 45%, 45 being three times. So three times 15%, 15%, 15%. So it'll be uh, total assignments, total 45% for the, all the assignments. Project, there will be, Proposal, so what you want to do, so it'll be a team of one to three people. Project, what you want to do will be a proposal, and then there will be, you you implement what you want to do, and then you do a final presentation over like two or three three classes, it'll, which will be 20%, and then the final paper, it doesn't have to be like a real like NIPS paper, but it could be like workshop paper, basically, four to five pages. Or if you're ambitious, you want to submit to like a AAA or IDCHI or even like iClear, you can do a, like a real paper. And then it'll be like 20% of the entire grading scheme. Uh, we'll do like a mock peer review, just like the conference uh, conference reviews. So 10% from the peer review and then 10% from from myself and the TAs. So yeah, I mean, they, these are like basically, I think the technical details will be like subject to change. All right, and then the material, there are no, so there is no material. I'll, if there, if need arises, I will, upload the reading materials to the classroom. So initially when I talked to the TAs, we were gonna to stick to KL, KLMS, which is KAIST for KAIST students. But since we have a lot of neighbor engineers, we are gonna to have to move on to classroom, which is third party. Third party. This, I heard that it's pretty similar to Slack, but it's more oriented towards like classes. So classroom, please join classroom. Uh, students and neighbor engineers all together. So the participant code is written here, written here, or you can click this link and then please register yourself and then make your names explicit. And then I will uh, post all the uh, announcements and all the like relevant materials to class. All right. And then expectations. So lectures you're expected to attend. So there are 5% attendance scores, which is, which is like not breaking but still you're expected to attend. And then homework will be, I, I'm not sure if I should call it a homework, but still like if your discussion among yourselves is great, but final solution, the coding must be done by yourself, which will not be very, uh, is, which will not be very heavy. It's, I'm thinking about doing once one city training, which you need to do in order to get access to EHR and then one pre-processing EHR and then one basic machine learning uh, model training. So that'll be it, hopefully. And then project group of one to three people and must do something relevant to the class. You can't do like something totally in, irrelevant to the class. And then the deliverables will be presentation at the final presentation. Demo will be just working code, basically. You, I, like you, you put some EHR or patient record and you can see the output, like the logistics score or, or like soft mix score, something like that. And then the code, of course, and the paper and review, which I already covered before. All right, and then the teaching team. So it's myself. Uh, my office hours are Wednesday, one three, uh, one p.m. to three p.m. This is my email. There are two TAs, uh, uh, Yongshik Lee and Min Gang. And please, uh, I will 
we will upload the the office hours of the TAs on Classum after after this class. So please check the Classum website regularly. And yeah, so there is a very short background quiz. I think we have just about the right amount of time. So this is to in order this is to adjust the contents of this course. I'm not sure how many of you are very familiar with machine learning theories, uh, the fundamentals, and how much of you are more like uh, familiar with uh, coding and stuff. So this is there's no right answer. So just uh, this is to to survey the. The, the level of the the audience of this class so that I can adjust the future content. So if you click this, now uh, you will see, uh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Can everybody hear me still okay? All good? Good. Okay, all right. So yeah, so please click that, click that survey and then there will be 10, or 11 questions. The final question is just how much you're familiar with TensorFlow or PyTorch. So 10 questions and please uh, enter your, if you're a student, enter your KAIST email. If you're a, a neighbor engineer or a line engineer, please enter your corporation email so that we can send it. You, you will receive your own own, own response. And also I, we, we will be able to do better statistical, like, you know, sort of report and analysis. So uh, put your email here and then just, uh, we have about 30 minutes left, so I'll just give maybe 25 minutes, and then, uh, yeah, I'll, I don't think it'll take more than three minutes per question. So please go ahead, and then I'll uh, I'll come back to you at 10:25. Then we'll wrap up the course. Uh, professor, can I ask some questions? Sure. Oh, uh, I think uh, because since the since this is only shared screen, mm -hmm. I cannot get this address to the. Oh, keyboard. okay, yeah. So oh, actually, you... I can I can paste this to the the chat. Um, let me see. I can't copy paste anything here. <laughs> All right, so I'm sorry, but you will have to actually. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure why I can. Okay, I, I can just uh, let me just type it here in the chat app HTTPS forms.gle 60pzspe1p90fa. All right, this is it. Thank oh. you so much. And okay, th I think there was a typo. Give me a second. Um, okay, form. Ah, oh, come on. Okay, I need to write it, everything again. HTTPS forms dot gle dot six o p z s p e one Q N M F nine U F A nine. Right. Yeah. Okay. So everybody, use the. Please look at the chat app, and then there's a link at the bottom. Oh, professor. Yep. And do you do you encourage to use utilize some database knowledge to these projects? Uh, uh, so, uh, database knowledge such as what? Oh, actually, I am kind of new beginner to the database, so uh -huh. I just oh no, when, when, yeah. So when I said that the hospitals d store their electronic health records uh, uh, relational database, that was the gist. That was the extent of database knowledge. You don't need to. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna. You, you, nobody is required to know the theories between like database knowledge, like the. I like acid or whatever that I learned like 20, 10, 20 years ago. So nobody's expected to know that or nobody's expected to build the database management system. It's just that it, it suffices to know that the electronic health records are dumped into relational database and relational database have a lot of tables that serve different purposes. And at least you should know the, the concept of primary key and foreign key. So if you have no idea what 
foreign key and primary key is please just read the intro to database. That will be, that'll be, uh, that'll be sufficient. Uh, by the way, if you don't know the answer to the, any of the question, just say don't know. Doesn't really, it's, it's okay. It doesn't really matter. This doesn't reflect on your final grade or anything. This is just a survey. Okay, in quiz zero, there is no domain knowledge related questions, only focusing on machine learning side, right? Yeah, yeah, because domain knowledge will be the main, I mean, if people are, so my, my idea, is, my strategy is if people are familiar with all these questions and I can focus more on the domain side of healthcare in the, in the course of the tutorial, I mean, in the course of the classes, if people are not familiar with this, I'll first have to, cover some of the material that relates to basic machine learning knowledge before jumping into more interesting stuff in healthcare. Yeah, I don't, I don't expect anybody to be familiar with healthcare. So that's okay.
Oh, uh, hello. It's Michael. I also have a, a small question. Sure. I was wondering uh, about the, like the the structure of the course. Uh, would it mm. be more like, um, say, an, a model zoo, uh, like an approach zoo, where we look at what works and what doesn't work in uh, in healthcare, or um, you know, more foundational, like what, what kind of more of a survey, uh, where we go no. into a bunch of papers per class, or no, I don't think we'll go through a lot of papers. We will go through. I mean, machine learning for healthcare is a pretty uh, young uh, discipline. So mm -hmm. there aren't any, I mean, there are a lot of papers that pour out these days in all machine learning areas, but we'll just go through some classical methods that really impacted the air, impacted the, the industry. And then that will be it. We don't, I guess we can go through some fundamental uh, machine learning papers that might impact healthcare in the future. Mm -hmm. Such as such as like BERT or Transformer, but uh, I don't think we'll go through a lot of like uh, application papers because that's okay. like very, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we'll we'll just focus on the core methodology of some of the papers that really impacted the area, and then rest of the the core rest of the classes will be spent on actually learning how to build a model, predict model based on EHR. Or maybe if, you, if you're interested, you can focus on various aspects of EHR. Some people might be interested in text portion of EHR. Some people might be interested in like images. Some people might be interested in uh, spectrograms. So that's all up to you. But before mm -hmm. that, we'll cover the, the core basic methodologies only. Okay, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor, there's a question from someone on chat and also I have a question too. Uh-huh. Uh, so could you answer for someone first. Oh, and, uh, uh, let me see the chat. Yeah. Experiencing graph data mining and machine learning. Uh, oh, so, okay. So to Mr. Lee Sang Hwan, so I'm not, can't, I can't, I don't con intend to provide a lot of graph mining uh, techno techniques in this course. Uh, we'll just use we will cover graph convolutional neural networks and all the graph neural networks uh, that have been recently proposed. And uh, we will try to apply that to EHR. If people, if some people are interested in that direction, we'll do that. But I won't do, I won't go through all the like, uh, the classical graph mining techniques, such as like counting the triangles and, you know, like distributed graph mining, uh, graph mining frameworks and stuff. Uh, I think pe if people are interested in graph mining, uh, you should definitely go attend uh, Dr. Ki Jung Shin's course, the data mining. He is an expert in graph, uh, graph data mining and graph uh, learning. So, yeah, he's the better person to teach you that material. And oh, somebody, yeah, so there was a question. Yeah, uh, my question is a very, very practical question. And sure. So, so many, our, our team, maybe neighbor, uh, published the uh, healthcare pro healthcare application before, mm -hmm. so I'm very wondering about how can I apply this knowledge to our service. But mm -hmm. you know, EHR is very formalized, very well formed medical data. But our service does not have such kind of very well formed data. So mm -hmm. any resource to uh, not very well formed data to predict and make a healthcare model. Uh, could you repeat the last sentence? Oh, sorry. So, um, so there's a very, uh, very detailed data. So EHR mm -hmm. is very detailed data, but like our service, there's lack of data, like Galaxy Watch or Apple Watch, to have just like a purse or weight or some kind of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So lack of data could be also lack of the uh, prediction. Mm. So. No, no, there... not, not necessarily, not necessarily. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I think what you're saying is that EHR is a very well structured data because it's a, it's a dump from the database, right? Right. So, but so, but how yeah, all the imaging data could be a very well formed model. Uh, uh well, well, uh, low, low. Uh, could you repeat what you, what you just said? As the audio is not really friendly. Uh, so, yeah. So. Our data is uh -huh. has very low dimension compared to EHR. Uh -huh, uh -huh. 
I was wondering about maybe maybe this is a problem of model, but uh -huh, this uh -huh. is there a research about this kind of low dimension model to uh, high quality machine learned machine learning model? Uh, I think that's the opposite is actually true. Not a lot of machine learning models operate on well structured data as opposed mm -hmm. to unstructured data because images are all unstructured data and audio audio is also unstructured data. So I think the 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 standard practice of machine learning is to build models on unstructured data and then make some predictions or whatever you want to do about it. So if you're you one of the examples that you said was the Apple Watch data or some some kind of like you know uh for example let's talk let's think about heart rate data like like a you can sample your heart rate at, at some some kind of some number of bits, and then you can have a spectro. You can transform that into a spectrogram, or you can like you can put it into the like a one line, like a uh, like a single line, a time series data, and that will be your unstructured raw data, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can just basically apply whatever you want. Like uh, one of the one of the one of the, the research that we did in, when I was in PhD was to use uh, EEG data, which is uh, in brain encep encephalo, encephalo, whatever something. It's like you, you put a lot of things on your brain and then try to like detect your brain signals when, you, when, you're, when you're sleeping. So it's a sleep study because when you mm -hmm. sleep, you, you, you emanate certain, like, like certain type of waves, right? Like alpha waves and beta waves or whatever. So you try to record that with EEG and then that becomes your, like time series on various frequencies, and then you can transform that using Fourier transform to a spectrogram. Then what we did is we just basically did confident on spectrogram because spectrogram is a two D, like a two D image, and then you can do like basic resonant on con resonant on on the spectrogram, and it works really really well. So mm -hmm. I don't think it. I think the challenge is more on the structured data side because data structure data contains a lot of abstract knowledge because images or audio 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 and audio signals images or spectrograms are raw signals it's a it's a signal coming from the nature itself so it, it doesn't contain any abstraction but structured data in, in database contains a lot of abstraction from human operation so it's real and i think deep learning models are suffering from dealing with abstract data rather than raw data so mm -hmm. i think the challenge is on on the other side actually thanks Professor. Yep. Uh, if I want to know uh, the latest new or uh, the latest research related to the field, is there any specific source that you recommend instead of just Googling? Uh, you mean re you want to, uh, you want like a, like a related papers on this topic? No, like, uh, like some because some uh, page or blog that you personally follow about this area. That oh, uh, is there any? No, I don't specifically follow any blogs or twitters. Um, I usually just go through a bunch of papers. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, nothing comes to my mind right now. If I stumble upon something, or if I come up with something, I'll post it on Classum. Uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay.
Oh, professor, uh, maybe this mm -hmm. is kind of out of context, but about EHR, is it from United United States, right? Uh, you mean the concept of EHR or the data set we're going to access? Uh, the data set. Uh, yeah, so the data set will be from, uh, it's called Mimic3, which is a op which is a data set open source by MIT, but the data set itself comes from Beth Israel Hospital, but it's open source, so anybody can access it for research purposes. So is there any, any other data set like from Korea or other countries? To, what, I, what I'm wondering oh, about is, I see. Mm -hmm. so, you know, the, the United States, the fee for your when I say hospital is very too high. So I think <laughs> not much people go regularly to hospital and when they are sick. So is there any more uh, more like time series data set from other countries? Uh, so to, to be clear, Mimic3, the open source data set is a ICU data set. So ICU being like intensive care unit. So mm. it's a, it's a oh. 중환자실. So oh. it's, it's, it only records events that happen within the ICU. So if you're like, like collapsing or if you're on the, on the verge of like mortality or expiration, you get like shipped to the ICU and then you like all the monitors and like devices get hooked up to your, your like system and then you get monitored 24 seven. So it's a very dense data set. But uh, so I'll talk about this more in, when I talk about EHR, but there are different types of encounters. There are inpatient encounters and outpatient encounters. Outpatient encounters being you just go to the hospital, you get diagnosed, and then you get medication, then you leave. So it's just one-time thing. But it's in, if you're inpatient hospital, if you're an inpatient encounter, you get admitted to the hospital, and then you sleep, and then you get monitored. So there are two types of encounters. And basically, Mimic3 is an encounter, encounter, encounter no, inpatient encounter data set. But in Korea, there's a uh, insurance, national insurance data set, which is basically outpatient, outpatient encounter data set. So we can, we can download it from Shimpyeongwon, which is, oh. I don't know what that is for, what that is pronounced, uh, what that is called in English. Shimpyeongwon being, give me a second. It's a health insurance review and assessment service. So yeah, so basically it's a, uh, so when, when hospitals treat you, they need to file for reimbursement according to the healthcare plan to this Shimpyeongwon organization. And then they review the file and then they pay money to the doctors. So they have all the records of all the like real insurance related transactions. So it's not as rich and like in depth as EHR, but uh, Shimpyeon data set is a, it's a claims data set. Basically, it's for re reimbursement insurance purposes only, but it does record the diagnoses, the medications, the procedures, the dates, and the money that the patient paid. So it's pretty, it's, it's okay. So it's, you can do fun stuff with it too. Mm -hmm. But it won't, but it will, it will not have x-rays or it will not have like clinical notes uh, it will not have all those like interesting different modalities. It's basically just structured codes with timestamps. So what I what I'm wondering about is so uh, so our goal is from to detect the danger, possible danger from our daily life. So, mm -hmm. so just the, the kind of uh, the kind of data like M M what the MIT data. So this very data from ICU. So that people are already in danger of mm -hmm. in their life. So mm -hmm. it can be a model for our daily life. Uh, so the, what you want to do is up to you. So if you want to build like a daily risk monitoring, like a model, then you can do, you can, you can do that. And you can still do that with Mimic3 actually, because uh, a lot of people do use Mimic3 for like uh, a chronic disease, chronic, chronic disease prediction, because uh, people who end up in ICU are usually usually have a lot of complex symptoms, so like chronic symptoms as well. So it's not a bad idea to model them. But as you said, people who end up in ICU are very sick patients. So there are certain biases within within the data set. So if you're interested in more like daily routine of the patients, then Shimpyeongwon data set is definitely what you want to what you want to access, and it's open for everybody as far as I remember. 
Yeah, well, yeah, okay. We, yeah, as per request, I will deal with, I will try to deal with both uh, Mimic 3 and Shin Pyongwon data set in the later classes then. Oh, by the way, it's already 1026. So I think everybody should start wrapping up and then submit the, uh, submit the quiz, please. All right, uh, I think we'll just wrap up. Uh, this will be the end of the first class. Uh, don't spend time on perfecting your answer in the quiz. Quiz. It's not for that purpose. It's just it's a survey. So don't 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 try to like get a perfect score out of this. There is no perfect score anyway. So all right. So um, I'll try to look at the quiz and uh, answers and try to adjust my material. And next time I will most likely likely talk about EHR. And try to uh, uh, try to guide everybody to go through the CD training in order to access the HR. So that will be that. And uh, if there are no more questions, uh, this will be it. And uh, everybody, please please register yourselves to Classum. I only see eleven member now, but please do so that you don't miss any announcement. Okay. And if you have questions, if you have any question, uh, you can direct your email to either myself or the TAs. All right. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much.